Welcome to the High Mag Cam channel. In this video, we won't be looking at a specimen in high magnification using a scanning electron microscope. But instead, we'll be looking at the parts and components of a scanning electron microscope at the macro scale. There are lots of books and papers out there showing schematic diagrams of various components and parts of a scanning electron microscope. However, there are not a lot of resources showing what these components actually look like in real life. A while back, I had the opportunity to disassemble an old scanning electron microscope, and I collected some of these parts and components. How heavy is this thing? Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh, there's a wire here. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! Let's go over the details of these components. First, we'll look at the electron source. To generate the electron beam that is needed to obtain high magnification images, we need an electron source. There are different types of electron source. There's the fermionic source, there's the Schalke emitter, as well as the cold field emitter. For this particular SEM I disassemble, it has a cold field emitter. Looking at the emitter, there is a V-shaped wire, and at the apex of the V-shaped wire, there is a sharp single crystal tungsten needle oriented in the 310 direction. In order to generate electrons from the cold field emitter, it needs to be in a ultra high vacuum environment. Ultra high vacuum means the pressure is 10 to the negative 9 pascal or 1 nanopascal. Just for comparison, we live in an atmosphere of 100 kilopascal or 10 to the 5 pascal. An ultra high vacuum environment is required to keep the single crystal tungsten needle in pristine condition, free of contaminants in order to generate the electrons for the electron beam. In the ultra high vacuum environment, a electric potential is applied around the tip of the tungsten needle, usually about several kilovolts, and that leads to the field emission of electrons. The electrons emitted from the emitter then passes through several anodes to achieve the desired accelerating voltage or beam energy. That is the electron source. And as with any optic instrument, any type of microscope, including optical microscope, there must be some lenses. So clearly, I don't have any glass lenses with me, but I have electromagnetic lenses. And for this SEM, there are three lenses. There are two condenser lenses and one objective lens. Starting off with the first condenser lens, I'm going to remove this metal plate on the top. And inside we can see a hollow cylinder. This hollow cylinder is connected by two wires, and inside this hollow cylinder is actually copper wires running around it, and the 900T here means there's 900 turns of the copper wire winding inside this. So this is the electromagnet of the condenser lens, and the role of the condenser lens is to control the size and current 
of the electron beam. Again, you apply a current through this electromagnet, and that would change the trajectory of the electron beam as the electromagnet alters the magnetic field. With any electron microscope, there are usually apertures that limit the amount of electrons passing through the optic system. The aperture of the scanning electron microscope is usually a strip of metal with several openings on this strip. Each of the openings has a different diameter, so you can control how much electron passes through. And there is this big knob here that basically allows you to select the aperture openings on this strip, where 4 is the smallest opening and 1 is the largest opening. And there are these fine adjustment knobs that controls the XY position of the aperture strip. Next, we have the second condenser lens. This one has a, uh, the assembly is a lot taller, as you can see. And again, there's a cap. I've removed the cap. And once again, we see a hollow cylinder. This is a electromagnet. And inside this electromagnet, there is the copper wire running inside. Here it says 1000 T, meaning it's 1000 turns. Let's put this electromagnet aside. And we can see there's this series of copper coils. This is actually a beam deflector, or deflector coils. And the deflector coils, they are used to control the shape or correct the shape of the electron beam, as electron beam can have astigmatism. So we use the deflector coils to correct the shape into a circular shape. And inside this assembly, there is two more coils. And at the bottom of this assembly, there is another set of deflector coils. So these deflector coils may be used to control the raster, the scan of the electron beam. And Depending on how large of an area you scan, if you scan a large area, that means you're getting a lower magnification image. If you scan a small area, you get a higher magnification image. So that is the beam deflector coil and the second condenser lens. Moving on to the final lens, that's the objective lens. This is the objective lens assembly. It has this cone-shaped geometry. It's really heavy because you can see it's a big solid block of metal. And again, I can remove the cover to reveal the lens. And here it is. This is the objective lens. Instead of the hollow cylinder shape. This one has the hollow cone shape geometry. And here it says 500T, meaning 500 turns. Inside this objective lens, 500 turns of the copper wire around it. And there's this big piece of copper on the objective lens. And the copper is actually connected to a copper pipe. Actually, this is a water-cooled objective lens. As you can imagine, when you apply a current through the electromagnet, it can heat up. And in order to achieve a good stability of the objective lens, it needs to be at a controlled temperature. And that is done by having the water cooler. The purpose of the objective lens is to have the electron probe focus right at the surface of your specimen. 
So the specimen is actually quite close to this objective lens sampling. When the electron beam interacts with the solid specimen, it generates different type of signal that includes secondary electrons or x-rays for the chemical analysis. So usually we use secondary electrons to form the image and we need detectors for that. So here we have a secondary electron detector. Because secondary electrons are the low energy electrons generated from the interaction of the incident electron beam with the topmost surface of the specimen. In order to collect these low energy electrons efficiently, a positive bias is actually applied at the opening of the secondary electron detector to attract these low energy electrons to be collected. And you can see that there is a white disk here that is actually the scintillator. When the electron strikes the scintillator, it con it's converted into light and the light is guided through a fiber optic bundle and then it hits a photomultiplier tube which converts white into electrical signal. And that ultimately forms the image we see on the computer display. I hope you guys enjoyed this video looking at the different components from a scanning electron microscope. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel. I'll see you guys next time.